The world of Fallout has a wide variety of mutated creatures, but I think the most iconic has got to be the ghoul. I'll always remember the very first time I saw one. I had just left Vault 101 and was following the main quest. I made it to Megaton and spoke with Lucas Sims, who pointed me to Moriarty's saloon. I went inside, and there he was. Gob, the barman, and local ghoul. I had no idea what I was looking at. It appeared to be human, albeit a human that had fallen into a metal grinder, left to rot, and then put back together. I was fascinated by him, and I wanted to learn everything I could. What he was, how he came to be, and more importantly, what everyone else thought of him. First off, let's take a look at what exactly a ghoul is. Now, just to be clear, a ghoul is a mutated human transformed through radiation, but it can also be a mutated animal, such as the ghoul rillas and the black bears or yaogwai. To save any confusion, I will be strictly focusing on the humanoid ghouls found throughout the series. And while there are subversions of a human ghoul, such as the Marked Men, they deserve their own dedicated video. With that said, let's take a look at the ghoul's origins. Sadly, the origins isn't entirely known, but what is known is that extreme levels of radiation seems to be the major influence of the ghoulification process. Not everyone experiences ghoulification. The majority of humans put to high levels of radiation tend to have a more fatal outcome. It is because of this people believe that those that have changed into a ghoul have some additional quality that prevents their bodies from succumbing to the radiation. So far, only two ways in which a human can transform into a ghoul are known. The first way is a gradual transformation. These ghouls retain the majority of their human form, but not entirely, as they have exposed muscle, flaking skin, and damaged connective tissue, resulting in the loss of noses, ears, and fingers. The second way is by having a close proximity to a nuclear blast and surviving to tell the tale. However, these ghouls suffer from both radiation and thermal burns. This way is typically faster than the first, but it is also more traumatic, leaving the ghoul with a much more grotesque appearance, exposed bones, unhealed wounds, and other extreme deformities. The majority of these ghouls have appeared as a result of the Great War, but there are rare cases of ghoulification happening after the Great War. One example is the NCR soldiers at Camp Searchlight, who, after legionaries unsealed the nuclear fuel casks inside the camp's fire station, transformed into feral ghouls. The transformation time varies from case to case, and can take as little as a few hours to as long as a year. It mostly depends on the intensity of radiation that the human is exposed to. Ghouls typically experience loss of skin and connective tissue, giving them an appearance similar to leprosy, with exposed muscle, bone, and in some cases internal organs. A general rule that also follows the ghoulification process is hair loss and changes to the vocal cords and larynx, leaving the affected with the signature raspy voice. The necrosis also comes with other issues, such as the attraction of necrophagous flies that consume and digest their dying tissue. Some ghouls also experience the loss of appendages. A great example of this is patchwork from Underworld. Patchwork is literally falling apart from the necrosis, but thanks to the town's doctor and the regenerative ability ghouls tend to have, these lost appendages are able to be reattached and even regain the ability to function. There are actually individuals who have willingly transformed themselves into ghouls, mainly to reap the benefits of eternal life. 
This has been achieved through a number of pre-war procedures. Desmond Lockhart, Eddie Winter, and John Hancock have all achieved ghoulhood through controlled exposure, radioactive experiments, and experimental radioactive drugs. These individuals who were able to control the levels of radiation needed to transform have also managed to avoid some of the side effects of ghoulification, keeping most of their hair and having little damage done to their vocal cords, although they do still suffer from necrosis. Ghouls are still required to nourish their systems. Although the amount and time between meals is hazy, we know that ghouls eat food and drink water. An example is Harlan at the Repcon test site, who after getting trapped, consumed radroach meat and condensation from the pipes in order to stay alive. Another example is Dean Domino, who mentions eating, although he's not really sure if he needs to. While ghouls can eat food and drink water, their regenerative properties can sustain them in the absence of nourishment. Coffin Willie was able to survive without oxygen, water, or food after the citizens of New Reno buried him alive. Woody went without any water or food for several weeks after falling into a deep sleep and became a public attraction. Billy Peabody, who I will admit is a little sus, apparently survived the Great War inside a refrigerator and then for another 200 years. Although theories do speculate that Billy was trapped after the Great War and has only really been in the fridge for a matter of days. Given the longevity of a ghoul's life, it would be a long and arduous task spanning generations of scientists to fully understand how a ghoul is able to live for so long, especially if they truly no longer rely on oxygen, water, or food. Ghouls are immune to almost all diseases that plague the average human, although diseases of the mind can still affect a ghoul. It's not just feralization that they have to worry about, but also things like dementia. One side effect of the mutation is having an enhanced immunity to recreational chems, such as JET. Murphy from the Capital Wasteland is trying to counteract this predicament by creating Ultra Jet, a stronger version of Jet that ghouls can use to get high. There does seem to be some contradiction to this, as Snowflake from Underworld uses Jet to get high because he's bored. But we don't know how much Jet he takes at once, or how much a single dose of Jet affects him. He could be a rare case where Jet does the same to him as it would a human. Ghouls can retain their normal cognition and are usually no different in terms of intellect compared to humans. In fact, many ghouls benefit from their longevity and amass both skills and knowledge far beyond the ability of a normal human. Surprisingly, ghouls still retain their sex drives, and even stranger, some humans develop a ghoul fetish. Despite a ghoul's want for intercourse, they lack the ability to procreate as the ghoulification process renders them sterile. Any ghoul child seen was transformed as a child, as with Billy, which shows that not only does the transformation increase their lifespan, but also appears to halt the aging process. As of yet, no canon sources have confirmed that a ghoul has been born already a ghoul. In the cancelled Fallout game, Van Buren, there was going to be a group of scientists responsible for creating the very first born ghouls, by experimenting on the fetus during gestation and then rearing the specimen until birth. I'm not entirely sure where I stand on born ghouls. I think it could make for a really interesting protagonist, but other than that, I'm not sure. Luckily, the game was cancelled and none of it is considered canon, but how do you feel about born ghouls? Do you like the idea of perhaps seeing them in a later Fallout title, or would you prefer them to remain non-canon? The degeneration into a feral state is not fully understood, only that it happens as a result of the brain deteriorating. It is said that when a ghoul no longer has the ability to think, it is feral. 
The factors that lead to a feral ghoul are unclear, but antisocial or isolated ghouls are more likely to turn. This isn't always the case, as there are examples of individuals living among groups that haven't transformed while the others have, such as Oswald Oppenheimer and Captain Zhao, whose co-workers and crew became feral while they remained the same. Mostly, anyway. Some ghouls don't always remain the same. There are ghouls that transform yet again, this time into a luminous necrotic post-human, or more commonly known as a glowing one. This transformation occurs when the organism of a ghoul stops filtering radioactive particles from the bloodstream. These radioactive particles then gradually build up and result in the affected producing a vibrant green glow. A unique feature of a glowing one is their ability to violently discharge radiation in a blast-like fashion. These ghouls are usually feral due to the large amount of radiation giving them their signature glow although there are very rare cases of a glowing one still possessing the ability to continue thought, such as Oswald Oppenheimer and Jason Bright. More often than not, ghouls are treated as a lesser being, referred to as walking corpses, brain eaters, zombies, shufflers, the list goes on. This is mostly down to a few factors. In New California, ghouls were almost unseen as their population isolated itself within Necropolis, the city of the dead. This isolative behaviour led to rumours of terrifying zombies living within the ruins, which wasn't really helped by the fact that caravans that entered the city very rarely came back out. A perfect example of racial prejudice towards ghouls is Vault City. In the ghoul town of Gecko, Waste from their nuclear reactor was leaking into the groundwater and contaminating the entire reservoir, which Vault City was also using. Harold, the Harold, that is, figured out the problem and tried contacting Vault City to get a replacement for the broken part, but every ghoul messenger that was sent to make contact was shot on sight. Before long, the citizens of Vault City were getting sick from the contaminated water and placed blame on the ghouls, who they believed did it intentionally. Far away from New California, ghouls experienced a similar treatment in the Mojave Desert, specifically in the New Vegas Strip. The Strip simply doesn't allow ghouls inside unless they're under the supervision of a human or have the permission from one of the casino leaders, although that almost never happens. This treatment has led to ghouls coming together to escape the suffering they endure at the hands of humans. Jason Bright, the glowing ghoul I mentioned earlier, created the Bright Brotherhood, who believe their only solace is leaving the planet entirely, simply to escape the risk of being lynched, shot on sight, or captured and hunted for sport. A lot of ghoul hate is caused by inexperience and ignorance, Dr. Julius Banfield willingly informs people that ghouls carry diseases due to the radiation damaging their immune systems, despite never having examined a ghoul up close, nor consulting any living ghouls either. Others believe that all ghouls are destined to become feral, such as Chief Security Officer Gustavo, who calls ghouls ticking time bombs and thinks it best to just rid the ghouls before they even have the chance to go feral. Another example of racial prejudice is Diamond City. During its foundation, ghouls were among the many who helped forge the settlement into what it is. But once McDonough became mayor, ghouls were no longer accepted as residents and forced to leave. These ghouls had no choice but to move on, travelling instead to more open-minded places such as Good Neighbour, but also making new settlements of their own such as the Slog. Sometimes, the ghouls only make things worse for themselves. Roy Phillips has simply experienced enough first-hand bigotry that he no longer sees a peaceful world in which both ghouls and humans can live. He is fixated with taking Tenpenny Tower for himself and will slaughter the residents if given the chance. Roy Phillips 
isn't the only ghoul to think this way either. Other ghouls share a similar mindset. In the ghoul city of Underworld, Dr. Barrows is threatened over his research into ghoulification, being told by the other ghouls that ghouls are ghouls and humans are humans. Fortunately, not all ghouls think this way, with many of them hoping to one day reverse the changes and return to their former, smoother selves. There are factions that treat ghouls as equals, such as the New California Republic and the followers of the Apocalypse, who willingly recruit them into their ranks for their knowledge thanks to their longevity and hardiness thanks to their natural resistance to radiation. Most ghouls that join the NCR usually achieve ranger status. I was curious to see how common it was to find a ghoul ranger, and the answer is quite. It's no secret that ghouls have got it rough. They have an almost endless life of constantly falling apart, and most of humanity, which they were once part of, no longer want anything to do with them. It's good to see polities such as the NCR and followers of the Apocalypse utilising ghouls and giving them the second chance that they really do deserve. Be sure to show your support by liking the video and subscribing if you haven't already for more Fallout content. If there's anything you would like to see in a later video, leave a comment and I'll see what I can do. With that said, thank you, as always, for watching, and I'll see you in the next adventure.